Welcome to the Tripod, where we break down the NRL every week, every game from a punting perspective. I'm Jacob Wynn. This is the Round 11 Preview. Now, last week, we had our first losing round on best bets for 2021. We went 0-2 on our two best bets. We lost the one and only multi, and which brings us to minus three multi units for the season. We lost the mixed matchup. If you've had 100 on every mixed matchup and every best bet throughout this season, you're up just over 1,100. And overall, the best bet record is 27 and 14, 66%, which is still extremely good. And look, both best bets lost in very close fashion. The Sharkies, we had plus eight and a half. They lost by 10. The Cowboys, we had plus 13 and a half. They lost by 14. But no excuses. Throughout the course of a season, you're going to have, obviously, any time you have a bet that loses by a really close margin, you can point to one moment in a game and say it could have easily been different. But they're going to go both ways throughout the course of a season. What I've got for you guys, tonight is three best bets for round 11 as we look forward one other point i should make just because it took 10 rounds to have a losing round doesn't mean we're guaranteed to win for the next 10 again uh, anything can happen in any given bet all i can do is try and give us uh, the best value that's sticking out to me in any given round and i do like the knights plus six and a half which is a dollar 85 on uni bet next best plus six a dollar 86 on top sport, that's the opening match of the round uh, in Townsville against the Cowboys. Look, the Knights' form has been really woeful, to be honest. Um, I think only two wins for them from the last eight. But I really see this as a desperation, all-in road trip where they're going to get into the trenches and really try and battle tooth and nail with the Cowboys. Um, and, and, you know, think about this. Just two weeks ago, we took the Broncos against the Cowboys in Townsville. We got plus six, but by the time the game kicked off, it was like plus four. And the Broncos lost by one. Are you telling me, as poor as the Knights have been, that the Knights are worse than the Broncos? I don't see it. Now, the Cowboys, they weren't disgraced last week against the Roosters. Losing Cohen Hess is a slight loss. But the thing about the Cowboys for me, as I always say... Nobody other than Tal Malolo really impresses me, and that's why I think this is a good matchup for the Knights, because their strength is their forward pack, and I think that will lead them to get on the front foot in this game, lay the platform for the Knights to win this, or if not, go close. My next best bet is on Friday night. I am taking either team to win by 1-12 to in the Sharks-Dragons game. You find that on Top Sport. Um, the market is called under full-time margins, full-time try bet 12 and a half. And then you select any other result. So it's either any other result or either of the team's 13+. plus. We want any other result, meaning I think either Sharks or Dragons win this by 1-12. to 12. It's paying $1.80 on top sport. Now, this has to be a must win for the Sharks. This is another team that hasn't won for six weeks. They haven't tasted victory since round four. New interim coach, Hane, has not had a victory with the side. You think they'll be desperate, and maybe they will be, and maybe that gets them a victory. But I think the Dragons match their desperation. I mean, this is a derby game. Yes, it's a Sharks home game on paper, but in reality, it's the Dragons home ground. They'll have plenty of fans out for them. The line has moved massively in this game, which Tristan's going to touch on later, and so am I about why. Um, obviously, the Dragons have had four suspensions in the fallout from Magic Ground, and Dufty is a big loss. But when I get into the deep dive in this game, I will explain why I think they can still cover those losses somewhat and field a pretty competitive 17 that's going to go to war with the Sharks. And arguably, without Sean Johnson available yet, um, still with that hammy injury, I trust the Dragons halves and Dragons hooker to come up with the play, big plays in a tight game when needed, more so than the Sharkies. So I think the Dragons showed me a lot of heart in that Storm game where they had sin bins and an early send-off. And just to give you some perspective of why I'm taking this specific bet, I mean, you can take the Dragons plus eight at $1.80, and I don't mind that. But by bet betting this bet at $1.80, you're basically getting the Dragons plus 12 and a half. The only thing is you're also risking the Dragons can't win 13 plus. Now, as much as the new rules means anybody can blow out anybody in any kind of game, because a game can change very swiftly, as we saw in Magic Round, I don't see that happening a big sh Dragons win. So I just see a dogfight style of game. I think it's perfectly suited for an either team 1 to 12 best bet. And finally, get ready for this one. Sunday, I'm taking the Rabbitohs plus 10 and a half. It's a dollar 90 Ladbrokes Ned sports bet. Uh, I think it's a don it's a don uh, it's a 10 and a half everywhere but a little lower price on a couple other shops as well. And they're playing the Panthers. The Mighty Panthers in Dubbo. Now, this weekend, round 11, in fact, sees two of the two preliminary finals from last year um, having rematches. 
And in this one, I'm going to take the Rabbitohs. Whether or not they get the full revenge and outright victory, I'm not so sure. But with the team they've got available this week, with Latrell back, a massive in, obviously. Mansell's also back facing his former team. This Rabbitohs side that's going to play in Dubbo on Sunday is too good to be catching plus 10.5 against anybody. And the Bunnies have been quite incomplete in their last few performances. You know, let the Titans get out in front, let the Raiders get out in front got destroyed, blown off the park against Storm, and then let the Sharkies come back last week. But the fact that they've been a bit incomplete means I know they've got room for improvement, and they're obviously going to need it, and they know that all too well, that they're going to need to improve against this Panthers side. And you guys know I have bet against them extremely sparingly in 2021, because it's no surprise to me how good this Panthers team is, and you don't want to bet against them. And it's not me jumping out saying, all right, I want to bet against Penrith this weekend, because I'm not going to give you many good reasons why you should bet against against Penrith. I just think the value is on the Rabbitohs this week. I think, as I said, because they've underperformed and I think sticking in people's mind is, is that 50-0 loss to the Storm that people are, are doubting how legit they are. But trust me, it was a perfect storm, no pun intended, um, with, of factors against the Bunnies on that given night. I think they will give up, they will put up one of their best performances of the season this weekend and they will give the Panthers their closest match of the year since that memorable Storm game in round three. Those are my best bets. Um, the new rules are crazy. I spoke about them for the first 10 minutes of the round 10 Magic Round recap. The pros and the cons of the new rules um, and all the punting implications. So go back to check my thoughts on that, although Tristan's going to touch on that uh, in, in Market Watch. I looked at the slate of games, and, and I don't bet a lot of totals, and I've been asked about that, and I think I covered that in one of the recaps as well. I just find it really hard to ever find a total in a game that I'm like 60% or greater confident is going to go uh, my way. You know, like totals can just change in the blink of an eye. We've seen with the six again rule, teams can just go bang, bang, bang with scoring, and now with the sin bins as well. I also think even the bookies... Um, aren't as confident on their totals. So they all try and mimic each other as much as possible. So it's very hard to ever find too much of an edge. So that's why I haven't given out any best bet totals. I'm just not looking for them. I'm not saying, oh, sh sh you know, should I be looking over, under in this game? If, if it comes to me naturally and I look at a game and I think, geez, both these teams, I reckon they're going to struggle to score, it's going to naturally lead me to an under. Or if I look at a matchup and I think, I think both these sides are hard to stop, Oh, for sure, I'll share an over. Because people have been asking me, why haven't you just been tipping overs? And in retrospect, I should have been. And again, uh, Tristan's going to touch on that from the bookies' perspective in because we've got historically high totals coming up for round 11. So before I go game by game into the matches, let's hear from Tristan. He's going to give you the recap of how the bookies did in Magic Round. He's going to tell you where the money's been for the upcoming round 11. And he's also going to clarify a couple of points of his insights last week. You guys had some questions about what he was talking about with the value of home advantage. And he's going to clarify what he said there. And also calculating odds for any time try scorers. G'day Tripod family, it's Tristan Merlihan here from Top Sport. Magic Round is done and dusted for another year. Uh, we had eight games where seven of them went over. So obviously the new interpretation of the rules really affected the total points in those games with a lot of players being sin bin and as a result the game's really opening up. Our punters really clued into that. They really unloaded on the overs as we got deeper into the week. We were trying to adjust to account for it, but it turns out we couldn't quite get the number high enough. The only game that stayed unders was the Bulldogs Raiders game and I think if anyone told you at the start of the week the Bulldogs score 18 points you probably feel they were a good chance of seeing that game go overs but not to be. So interesting weekend of football. Uh, the biggest swing from our point of view was the Roosters Cowboys game. That last try was quite instrumental in, in a whole heap of different bets whether it be uh, the line and also the totals. So that one was, was a big swing and the punters ended up on the right side of the ledger there and obviously finishing the game or the last two games of the weekend with two heavily backed short price favourites getting the result. Even though the, the Dragons were back very or shortened very early in the week on the back of the Storm players pulling out, that wasn't necessarily due to weight of money. That was just more so the player movements and there was a good, a good swing of money late there for the, for the minus. Um, we move on to this week and it's a really interesting week for us as, as a trading group to try to work out how we're going to assess and reassess these rule changes. Obviously the total points need to move upwards. We've made a number of changes in that department now. We've got a game where uh, this early in the season, I don't think we've seen a game of 50 points plus for a total points um, for a long time and the Roosters play the Broncos and we're, the line at the moment is sitting at a flat 50. It opened at 48 flat, it's moved out to 50. I'd be, I wouldn't be surprised if it gets above 50 come Saturday night when that game kicks off. 
again, we got a number of lopsided games. The, the, the biggest move of the weekend uh, where we probably put our hand up and say we slightly got this one wrong, or more than slightly when we opened the markets, the Dragons opened $1.82. There were a lot of players up for judiciary, and that game's been backed off the map. The Sharks now into a dollar forty. The Dragons are three dollars. Obviously, Dufty out compounds the problem, um, but the the Sharks are shortening up. In saying that, the Dragons are pretty gutsy there last weekend in in sticking with the Storm despite being um, a man down for the bulk of that game. But as that game sort of shifts out, you wonder if the, if the Dragons get to a backable price at the plus, particularly. Uh, Jacob asked me to clarify a couple of things from last week. When I said the uh, six to eight point swing, I was meaning that in a net in a net value in terms of the home ground advantage. So, in other words, if if a game was Pickham and it would probably be a four point uh, swing either way, or a four point favourite or a four point plus, depending on who who was the home side. So that's just a little bit of clarity on that question. The other one in terms of the any time try scorers. Um, in terms of how we determine those, we look at the, as we touched on, the, the number of tries we expect players to score in their given team, uh, how many tries we expect the team to score in total points for that team as well, which obviously comes down to the goal-kicking percentages and those sort of things. And then from there, we look at the players' past data, we look at who they're matching up against, and we put a bit of thought in, into a whole heap of different range if a team's been attacking down one side of the field or, more importantly, if the alternate or the op- opposition side's been leaking points down one side as well. So, a bit goes into it all and, and hopefully that gives everyone a bit of a background on how all that sort of stuff works. Hopefully everyone has a good weekend on the punt. And as- Thank you, Tristan. So as you heard there, guys, he wasn't saying last week that any home ground is worth six to eight points, but he was saying the swing can be six to eight points. So if you think back in the day, maybe when the Cowboys were really gun and so were the Storm, and if, if those two teams were considered equal... If they played in Townsville, you'd have the Cowboys minus three and a half or minus four. But then if that game was flipped to Amy Park, you could have the Storm minus three and a half, minus four type of scenario. So that's where he was talking about home field can be worth as much as six to eight points when it flips. And a bit more insight there into how they calculate any time try score odds. And Tristan's also touched on um, on the historically high totals. I mean, how often do you see a, a game which I'll get to, with a total of 50. But before that, let's go back to the beginning match of the round, which I've already kind of touched on because I've shared a best bet. That is the Cowboys hosting the Knights at QCB Stadium. And the prevailing line is plus 5.5, but the best bet is plus 6.5, $1.85 Unibet. Next best, plus $6.86. On toppy, and I think I've said before, I think half a point around the key number of 5 is worth 10 cents. So going complete, sorry, the key number of 6 so going through the key number of six, and what I mean by that is the difference between getting plus six and a half to plus five and a half, or the opposite would be if you lay minus five and a half as opposed to six and a half, I think that's worth 20 cents of value if you want, want to um, rationalize it that way. The only change for the Cowboys is losing Hess, who's actually done quite well uh, since he's been moved into the middle. Heimel Hunt is out for the Knights. Um, he's kind of been in and out, been troubled by a hammy. Um, it, it is a huge game. As, as I said, like, I think I said a week ago, I still believe the Knights will make the eight. Now, a day later, Ponga was ruled out with a problematic hip, and, he, and he's not back for this one. So I said that I expect the Knights will still make the eight before they then lost Ponga and lost to the Tigers. There are no certainties to make the eight, of course. And I really feel in the battle for the top eight, the way that the ladder is shaping up this year, matches like this one ultimately will be the games that decide who gets in and who and who misses out. So it's a huge game for both sides. The Cowboys, no doubt about it, were far more impressive than Newcastle last week. The Cowboys were in that game with, with 2015 to go against the Roosters, whereas the Knights were just second best, second rate um, against the Tigers. But in a way, with the longer pr- preparation, I think that that... That loss particularly hurt them because of how bad it was, and it was the second time they'd lost to the West Tigers, the lowly West. So I really think that actually should mean absolutely no excuses, and the Knights have to show what they're made of this week. And while Ponga is a massive loss, this Tex Hoy is a talented kid who really needs to step up now. He's had a few games deputizing, and they did start the season without Ponga. So he's had enough games to kind of mix in with the team. He has to step up because on the other side of the equation, Valentine Holmes is starting to blossom and starting to regain 2018 form. But the ultimate matchup edge I see in this game is the Knights forward pack. I think that there's guys that are in origin contention. It's just a stronger unit across the board and into the bench that I think leads them to victory. But if not, if um if the Cowboys have better execution in the outside backs, I still think we're going to be within that, that six points uh, of margin of victory, which would still cover our plus six and a half. 
Next up, the Warriors host Wes at Gosford. The line is minus four and a half. Warriors favoured. So the Warriors lose Curran, Rocco Berry, and Sirinan. Aitken was a late inclusion. He's back in the team again. Um, so his late inclusion last week played, and he's playing again this week. Montoya back in, and Jack Murchie is into the side. And the Tigers get to name the same 17 that won last week, with Dewey again playing right centre and by at 5'8". That actually did work out for him after a lot of people, including me, questioned that. The biggest challenge for West now is putting two performances back-to-back. Now, they've won three games from the first 10 rounds. Obviously, they have not won back-to-back games this season, but they haven't even been close in back-to-back games. So so I would consider that the three wins and the golden point loss to the Rabbitohs were all good performances, and every time they've had a good performance, they've been blown out the next week. So that is their challenge, but I do believe that for them, they get a seven-day turnaround to come into this one on Friday versus the Warriors who are off a five-day turnaround. I do believe the Tigers are going to be so focused on that um, to come out and actually put together a back-to-back performance. The Warriors will also come in focused, I believe, getting back to their camp. And and after a game against the Eels where they fell behind 24-0 and then were fighting uphill the rest of the way, and to be fair, did fight themselves back into the game, um, I've kind of got reasons to like both teams. A few, I do believe the Tigers will come in and put in a good performance. But then, like, this Warriors team is legitimately scary. They've acquired Walsh mid-season. Um, Harris Tavita is back in this team off injury. Nick Arima in good form at halfback. And then, of course, Roger. So there's guys that can hurt you all around the field. And the Warriors can also make life difficult for you when they're controlling the ball and they're keyed in defensively. So I completely understand why the Warriors are the home favorites here. And when I've got reasons why I like both sides and I think it can be a good game, that's usually where there's not enough value lopsided on one side. So I pass in terms of a best bet. Move to the next matchup, which is the Sharks uh, hosting the Dragons. Again, a game I've touched on because you know my best bet is either Team 1 to 12. But as I said, it's called any other result in the full-time margins. Try bet 12.5, $1.80 on top sport. Now, the line is Sharks minus 7.5. The line on Tuesday, as Tristan said, was... Sharks plus one and a half. And this is another example where if you're in the tripod group, you had the opportunity to bet that. We had two different members that posted it within a minute of each other saying, hey guys, it's been confirmed that four Dragons have been handed down suspensions and obviously Dufty's out for more than a month um, and the Sharks are underdogs and you can jump on. And that was available for people in the group. It's not saying that um, I could share out, unfortunately, because... Again, I've explained like not everyone necessarily can be on their phone 24-7 and can get the same access to an early tip. But if you are, that that was there for you. And that's obviously a great bet to have in your pocket now. As Tristan said, you've gone from Sharks paying $2 to Sharks paying $1.40. And they've named an unchanged side. Uh, Obviously, Johnson withdrew last week, which played havoc with my best bet. I took plus 8.5. Line closes 10.5. Lose by 10. Um... And that was a big loss. He's played 199 games, so he's stranded there because this sounds like he's still not going to be good to go this week. And you know what? I've been talking a bit about the Sharkies and how they're not a basket case. They're not terrible where some people think that they are. They are because they got blown out in a couple of games where a lot of stuff went against them. Maybe fighting back from 20 nil down against the Rabbitohs has shown some people a little bit of what I kind of have seen in them. But then again, they still lose by 10 um, and maybe people will say, well, you know, they never, or they, they fell down 20 nil. How good can they be? So maybe people will still dismiss the performance by the Sharks. I think they'll come to play in this one. I talked about how they've got to be so desperate because it's been so long since they've won a game. And this is very fortuitous to catch the Dragons on a week like this with all the key personnel out. To clarify who's out, Maguire, Fumaono, Ravalawa, Tarek Sims are all suspended plus Dufty shoulder. But if you go through each player in terms of what they lose, I mean, they only acquired Maguire a few weeks ago. They were doing fine before he got there. Ravalau has been in and out. They actually have the outside back depth a little bit with like the Fiungai twins. Excuse my pronunciation because I'm I'm hearing different pronunciations of um of some of these players' names. So I do my best. Cody Ramsey being flipped to fullback, I actually find exciting. Um, so I think he's actually more naturally a fullback than a winger. The big loss is is losing those edge back rowers in Fumano and Sims, and that certainly then has a a trickle down effect that thins out the Dragons bench, and that is why 
obviously it's justified that they should now be a considerable underdog um, because it's been the, the forwards laying the platform that's been the basis of their best performances. But, but when you still consider the derby game, the home ground is really Dragons, um, and the fact that they know they've got a lot of outs, so I think they really will take that as a challenge. I don't see any kind of white flag flag being waved by the Dragons here. I think they're going to come and give the Sharks hell and make this game absolute warfare. And that's why I think in a desperation game, I've got to lean towards it being close, and that's why I love playing either team 1-12. to 12. Um, and good luck to the guys that got Sharks, you know, to win at $2. Um, I guess you, when you beat the market by eight points, that's fantastic. But as we saw last week, a lot of people beat the market with Dragons against the Storm, and it, it still doesn't guarantee a win. But all you can do is try and get a line or, or a price that's better than, than what it closes at because generally the market gets more and more educated because lots of smart people and lots of smart information is out there and people are trying to win money. And um, and if you're beating any line or total by over a converted try in the long run, it's pretty much impossible to not make money. So good luck to the boys who are riding the Sharks outright win. Happy for you to win 1-12. to 12. Hey guys, I just did the whole round 11 preview and I forgot to mention the mixed matchup. So I'm shoehorning this back in after I've discussed the Sharks-Dragons game. Basically, simply the mixed matchup is going to go against the Sharks because I've got a best bet on the Dragons and I think the Dragons keep it closer than expected. And we're going to bet on the Knights who I have as my best bet for the opening match of the round. So the Knights to outscore the Sharks. Now we're a pretty decent underdog this week. Knights are only expected to score close to 20 points, whereas uh, Sharks are expected over 24 and a half. But at $3.50, we know how crazy scoring can be in these matches. So I don't think it takes much to swing a try, maybe a try less for the Sharks or one try better than expectation for the Knights. So it's $3.50 on Top Sport. You can have up to $100 max stake on that one. If you need to join Top Sport, you can with a co promo code TRIPOD. We move to the next game on Saturday, which is the Titans hosting the Dogs, and the line is minus 13.5 with the Gold Coast favoured. That was such a disappointing loss for the Dogs, and I was there at Magic Round last weekend, so I saw them choke against the Raiders. This is a Bulldogs team that has won once this year, that was down 10-0, that fought back, that took the lead, and that one stage was playing 13 on 11, and for the remainder of the game, 13 12, verse 12, with the Doggies, well, sorry, with um, with the Raiders, who have lost a lot of key players this season, and, and in that very game, had Whiten and Papali sent to the bin and, suspend, uh, and, and sent off, and they blew it, and they got opened up for... Two tries when they had the man advantage. Um, I don't know if they can get over that, but I'll talk about that in a second. But they do at least get uh, Dylan Napper back on their bench, while for the Titans, SSA and Peachy got suspended from the Panthers game. Don't forget David Fafida is still suspended. Ash Taylor, there's whispers he could come back into the team. He's been named in the reserve, so he may or may not be in. Okay, if we look at the Titans-Panthers game, I actually did my live recap before that kicked off, and literally in the live recap, I said, with these new rules, if there's an early send-off against Penrith, they're going to beat somebody 60-0. Sure enough, SASA got, went mad, got sent off early, and the Panthers scored a try with like 10 or 15 to go that made the score 48-0. They reviewed it and found an obstruction and cut it, so it wasn't 48-0, it was 42-0, and then in fact... Titans went bang to bang bang and scored a couple of tries and um and ended up losing I think 48-12. But if if not for that kind of little obstruction they found, 60-0 was on the cards. So as I say every week, I find it really hard to judge Penrith opponents because Penrith makes everybody else look like a reserve grade side basically. So I can't take a heap away from a Titans side that had a man sent off early getting smashed by Penrith. I don't know many teams in the competition who wouldn't have um, have had the same thing happen to them. Deep down, I still think the Titans are going to make the eight. Um, so therefore, this kind of qualifies to me as a good team off a bad loss. But you know what? Like, the Titans lost by 30 last week. They've only won four of six games. They're missing $3 million in players when you consider Ash Taylor on $1 million, um, Fafita on over a million, newly acquired SESA and, and Peachy, as I mentioned. My instinct was this line's going to be like minus nine and a half, and I'll probably like the Titans. Um, 
But to be minus 13 and a half, the bookies are doing you no favors. You've got to lay a pretty substantial line for a Titans side that has been far from perfect this year. So it's, I don't feel like I'm getting line value if I was to bet the Titans. I look at the dogs and I don't want any part of them. I think, again, as I touched on, I don't know if they're going to get over that loss easily. It's kind of that phenomenon. If you think about the Broncos, they blew that game up in Townsville where they had a six-point lead late and lost to the Cowboys. And then the next week, they had to play a tougher opponent, and they got blown out. And that's kind of what might happen to the doggies in this one. So again, you can kind of make a case for either side. That's why I don't have a best bet. Moving to later on Saturday night, the Roosters host the Broncos at the SCG, and the Broncos are plus 19.5 in the game. Tristan said has a total of 50 points, and he's predicting it may even climb. And I heard a stat that in 2020... The Roosters scored 117 points against the Broncos. So, um, you know, you can understand why it's a high total. Now, I'm going to just go on a tangent here because I I think it's going to get brought up in the news again that the Broncos could have signed Sam Walker. And I just want to give the Broncos a little bit of positivity. Try and put a positive spin on this. Okay, if you're a Broncos fan, you're probably a Queensland fan. Let's be honest, the Sam Walker kid has so much talent But it's not all about how much talent you have. You think about the environment he's in for his career. Could he have been in a more perfect landing spot to have his talent nourished, cultivated? Um, So, you know, if if this kid, Sam Walker, is helping Queensland win an Origin Series or plural series throughout his career, you have to wonder what level could he have got to if he was in this Brisbane Broncos establishment and and in, in their system. So... I'm trying to give you a positive there, Broncos fans. There's not a lot going on. Um, Speaking of talented halves whose career did not flourish in Brisbane, Anthony Milford is now dropped. And um, you think about kind of sliding doors moments. A guy, Corey Oates, is also dropped. And I'm not saying it was his fault on the final play of regulation time in the 2015 Grand Final. But as we all know, that miracle try by the Cowboys forced extra time and the Cowboys beat the Broncos. Sorry to remind you guys, but you just think... Anthony Milford would have won the Clive Churchill in that medal. How different would these guys' legacies be? They'd be competition winners, Ben Hunt, McCulloch, Milford. Um, and instead, they, you know, they, a lot of people are looking at a guy like Milford's tenure in Brisbane as a failure, considering the money and the expectation that he's has been on that he's come up. And, and he's replaced this week by Albert Kelly, who's a bit of a journeyman at this point. 30 years old, has played some first grade back in the day uh, with Sharkies, Gold Coast, and then has played Super League. But more recently, he's been... We had South Slogan in the Q Cup. So, again, a mix-up in the Broncos' halves. He's going to line up alongside Gamble. And I think I mentioned Corey Oates is out. Jordan Rickey is also a big loss suspended a week or two off losing Pat Carrigan for the season. So, is this a good game to come in and debut for Albert Kelly? I mean, on one hand, there's no pressure because nobody expects the Broncos to win. But on the other hand, have you seen what Kevy's done after they've been flogged in a couple of these games? He seems to drop halves, you know, without rhyme or reason, um, seems to always pin the results on the halves. So a bit of a, a baptism of fire to, for his um, kind of rebirth into the NRL, Albert Kelly. But good luck to him because this Roosters side is a very tough proposition, uh, especially at the SCG. And they, for once, and very rarely this season, can say they're naming an unchanged 1-17. to And you wonder, like, they scored the first four tries against the Cowboys... And they didn't capitalize that on that in the sense that they let the Cowboys back into the game. And the Cowboys were within two points later in that game. So I actually think the Roosters, against another soft kill, could be quite ruthless in this one. I definitely have no faith in, in Brisbane to keep this close. So definitely not taking Brisbane. I thought about whether you'd lay the minus 19.5 with the Roosters. But I think there's a premium on these lines where it's a fairly obvious mismatch. So I just I don't think the value is there on the Roosters, but I don't have the confidence to be on Brisbane on passing that one. Move to Raiders hosting the Storm, and as I mentioned before, I think um, well with the with the re- fallout of uh, the Magic Round game with Whiten with his dangerous tackle, Papali high contact, and Hodgson with the wicked wing, they're all suspended, which brings Sam Williams into six. Ryan Sutton has to return early from injury. Uh, on the Storm side of things, Pappenhausen was hit high and it's still out with those concussion symptoms. Smoothie, MCL, Munster, who was withdrawn after team list last week, is still out, as is Harry Grant. On a positive side of things, Brandon Smith, the hectic cheese, returns for the Storm. They have named Chris Smith 
at 5'8". I actually would predict Cooper Johns will get an opportunity to play 5'8 this week. Um, Chris Smith, to me, is more of an edge back rower. Um, this is almost all at also a prelim rematch. And these two, not only is it a rematch of the prelim last year, which was a bit of a mismatch in the end with the Storm running out in front and um, never giving the Raiders a shot, there was also a great match between these two teams in Canberra, which, which the Storm won. So I I guess Melbourne's won the last two matchups, but deep down, I feel like the Melbourne Storm owe the Ra- Raiders a few home defeats because I can't help but get the, I can't get those uh, wins out of my head of those famous big wins that the Raiders have had over the Storm in 2019 and in 2020 in big games. So I think the Storm are going to come in kind of a mean attitude in this one. And look... The Raiders, I think, will get an enormous amount out of that effort, rightfully so. Get the fuel from from um, from that comeback victory against all the circumstances to beat the Bulldogs with, with the men in the bin that I mentioned before and the, the circumstances in that game. But going from trying to play the Dogs to play the Storm, it's a pretty big jump in class when you're missing your three best players, arguably, and Hodgson, Whiten, and Papali. Now, I understand the Storm are still undermanned, but we've seen when they've been missing key position players, they plug next man in, and they seem to still do the job. So the Storm are starting to hit that Penrith Panthers territory where you look at the line and you might think, oh, yeah, that's actually that's good value against the Storm. And look, to be honest, we bet against the Storm multiple times in the first five or six weeks of competition and, and made money overall for sure, finding some good opportunities to go against them. But usually, especially recently, the run of form that the Storm have been on, if you've bet against the Storm, you are regretting it at some point throughout the game. So it's getting to a point for me where it's really more like play Melbourne or pass the game. A little bit like I've been saying every week with the Panthers, although we're going to get to that one next, and I'm actually going against Penrith. But I'm not going against Melbourne in this one. And I said at the start of the year that I think the Raiders have as close to the best squad depth as anyone in the competition. So this is the kind of game where you test that depth. And I won't ignore that potential boost in morale that potentially was getting a bit sour around camp with those run of results and with Ricky blaming everyone inside and outside and with um, players in and out of the team and players talking about wanting to leave or, or, or passing up captaincy. You had to wonder whether this team was all pulling together. But a winning cures everything. That was an immense comeback win last week it could just be enough for the Raiders to um, get some confidence and really fight hard at home against the Storm so I'm not going to lay the big number with the Storm either we then have a cracker Sunday uh, double header and I'll tell you right now guys I've actually there's a little person in my family having a birthday party so I will not be able to watch these games live and therefore I won't actually be free to record um, the live recap. So I'm just giving you guys a heads up. If you tune into the recap, I'm going to have to postpone that 24 hours and do my round 11 recap um, Monday night, just to give you a heads up. And it's a shame I can't watch them live, but I'll definitely still, um, I've, I've got avoiding a score down to an art with the amount of sports that are on at all times. And I try and watch so much and I, I enjoy watching sports so much more if I don't know the score. So I'll lock my, my phone under lock and key and then I'll, I'll watch these um, watch these games when I can. And it's the Rabbitohs playing the Panthers in Dubbo. And as I said before, the line plus 10.5 with the Rabbitohs. And that's also my best bet at $1.90 on Ladbrokes, Neds, and Sports Bet. Latrell back. Walker then gets to return to six. Benji to the bench. Mansell back to face his former club. This Panthers side that once again was ruthless at Magic Round gets even stronger because Capewell returns. I feel it's notable to mention Isaiah Yo and Matt Burton are also from Dubbo. But I just can't seem to shake the fact that this line seems too high. When we came into season 2021, who were favourites to win the Premiership? Not the Panthers. The Rabbitohs were favourites to win the competition. Now, for what it's worth, when I did the season preview, my prediction was Panthers to win the competition this year and to play Storm in the grand final. So far, that's still on track. But I don't feel like the Rabbits have done a lot wrong over 10 rounds. There was a point in this season after losing the opener where I think the Rabbitohs won seven or eight in a row. I just think that that 50-0 game where they were very undermanned and where things just went from bad to worse against the Storm overall has people thinking they're not on a level of those those clear top two class teams in the competition. But as I said, even with Cam Murray out and even against the full-strength Panthers, 
that are just riding a, a crazy wave and that we know that Penrith's going to be up for this, I still think this is going to be a cracking game. Now, you've been hearing in the previews, um, it's people are calling it an origin audition because obviously Jerome Luai is very much in the mix and you've got Cody Walker on the other side. It's a funny one to me because right now I still feel like Jack White would be deserving of a 5'8 position, but for sure, if either uh, Walker or Luai puts up a huge performance in this one, especially leading their team to a win, that's not going to go unnoticed by Freddie Fittler. So that matchup's going to be enthralling. You've got Reynolds versus Cleary. Everything they bring to the games is epic. Cook versus Coruscant. The, the outside backs, Latrell back and the former Johnson, Mansour against his old side versus all those electric Panthers outside backs. And even... You know, you've got Origin back rowers like Jaden Sewer, Jai Arrow, the new addition, against the Panthers back row who are all rep players. So I've looked at games week in, week out, and barely even considered betting against Penrith. But the more I looked at this game, I, I was considering that this is the week to do it. So I'm pulling the trigger. Play the plus 10.5. If the Rabbitohs can fight them to a close match, there's still a chance that they could get blown out late. But honestly, I really th- I think that highly of this Bunny's team, I think it's going to be a cracking game. And if you think a game's going to be a great game, you've got to take plus 10.5 points head start. Finally, Eels play the uh, Manly Seagulls at Wank Best Stadium. The line is minus 7.5, Parramatta favoured. And this should also be a really exciting game. Um, the Eels, minus 7.5, funnily enough, was so close to being a best bet for me last week, guys. I literally, I said, yep, I'm locking it in. I typed it out. I screenshot Um and then I'm just, I'm just about to do the pod, and I'm like, oh, bloody, there's too many players that are still just not 100% confirmed for this game. I'm not going to risk it. And I didn't play it. And and funnily enough, I did mention that I really felt the factor of this 18-year-old son of the coach debuting would be a huge motivating factor for, for Parramatta. And in the end, they won the game by, what, 16? And everybody was talking about how it was true that that really was a massive emphasis for them. So... Um, that's the one that got away. I wish I'd played that now as best bet, but that's the way it goes. So we've got this in, in Parramatta of Manly. We've got two teams that were both really impressive in Magic Round. Only change, major change for either team is foreign, got a broken hand, but I don't think that's going to hurt Manly too much when you've got Cade Cust that can slot into 5-8. So here's a question for me. How good are Manly? Because I think everyone's got to agree Parramatta's the third best team in the comp below the like the get the key um big guns from the grand final last year. Now, depending on what you think of the Rabbitohs, if they had a full complement, could South Sydney beat Parramatta? Potentially they could. So even if we say Parramatta's definitely third or fourth best team in the comp, most people would probably say the Roosters are the fifth best. So let's not forget that just two weeks ago we won with a best bet Parramatta minus four and a half at home to the Roosters. So now I find myself asking the question, are Manly on the level of the Roosters? You've got to keep in mind the recent form of Manly and the fact that this is a Roosters team with no cord, no, no friend, no BMOs, no Kiri, no Verils, right? I think Manly are pretty much playing on that kind of Roosters level. So um, why would I lay minus seven and a half when the Eels team is, is missing Nathan Brown and Dylan Brown and not to mention Manly are on the nine-day turnaround versus seven-day for the Eels. So if anything, it'd be the Bird Gang or Pass for me. And I just have too much respect for Para still when they play at home that I'm not confident enough to take that line with Manly. Therefore, I pass that one. And that just leaves me with the three best bets that I've shared for you guys for round 11. Uh, please let me know what you make of those best bets or what anything I've said tonight. Let me know what you are seeing for your best value bets for this weekend or any other thoughts you got in the upcoming footy. Love discussing footy. Love discussing hunting with everybody. It's very hard to win. It's quite easy to lose. So as always, please gamble responsibly. Lego. 